Got my shit together. Liddy City. Yes, I love it, Alicia. All right, guys. Tonight, you know what it you know what it do. Thank you, Alvy Knights Girl, for the first three badges. Look at you, my love, killing it tonight. All right. We are breaking down the next four chapters of Margaret Joseph's book, Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget. How to survive in business and in life. We have a lot to break down tonight, a lot to cover in these chapters. But shall we dive in? Did everyone read their chapters? Does everyone get where are my girls at? Suki, your girls are in the house, right? Where's the Zach Pack at? Where is that Zach Pack at? Hi, Ansley. Got back from a great vacay. I know you did, Jesse. You get it, girl. All right. So first up, we have chapter five. Chapter five, hold on. I need another can. Yes, Suki, go get your can. Who has, um, yes, thank you, Elvie Knights girl, for the first batch. Thank you, my boy, Ollie. Yeah. Who has ordered some no-filter wine this week? You got to start sipping, you guys. We got the weekend coming. Place your order now. That way we are ready. Okay. Still on sober January. Well, Ansley, I'm counting down the days for you, girl. Okay. Let's start with chapter five, Daddy Issues Not. So the chapter, this chapter is about Margaret's affair with her boyfriend and meeting her husband, Jan, her first husband, Jan, not the, not Joe, who's on the show with her currently. This was the husband before Joe. This was Jan. So Margaret had a boyfriend and his name was Harrison. And Harrison was apparently perfect, but she fucked it up. Her words, not mine. Harrison was apparently great. He was off at law school. Um, Jan was a colleague that she had met. And they just had like a spark, a chemistry. Jan was much older. Harrison was much more age appropriate. We loved Harrison because he had, he was good looking. He was age appropriate. He was going to become a lawyer. He had a good head on his shoulders and he was like ready to kill it in life. Jan, on the other hand, was an old man with three kids. Older man, 20 years older. He was in his 40s. What can you say? So they apparently, you know, were working together and then they were like, you know what, let's, why don't we go out sometime? So they decided to meet at a parking lot at the nearby Hilton Hotel. Hi, Suki. Hi, Alicia. Shamara, we missed you, boo. So they decide that they're going to meet up at the Hilton, okay? Because apparently that's, according to Kathy Hilton, where all the good food is. So they went, they were in the parking lot, and originally he was late, and Jen was like a little behind, and she was like, oh my God, this old man is not going to dump me because he ain't even that much of a catch. Well, he ended up showing up, and he came, and they had a great time, and then... Initially, well, this is where she finds out that initially he lied about his age and he was actually 20 years older than her. And he ticked her off because he asked on their first date when they went out to dinner, he asked if she would be bringing home a doggy bag. And she didn't like that because she's like, you're cheap. And my other lawyer boyfriend that doesn't know that I'm on a date with you right now, he's not that cheap. And he knows that I don't take home a doggy bag on the first date, bitch. Well, she didn't take home a doggy bag if you were wondering because she thought that that was cheap and anybody to, to suggest that was equally cheap. So they thought that like things were going to really go somewhere. Things were getting hot and heavy and things were getting serious. So Jan even, Jan even drove Margaret to the airport so that she would go and break up with Harrison, but she wanted to do it in person. So he was like, okay, let me drive you to the airport so you can go break up with the boyfriend that you're still dating that's off at law school that has no idea that you're dating an entirely different guy but she says that she couldn't do it. So, you know, she couldn't break up with Harrison. So what does she do? She decides to keep both boyfriends and they're a secret. She says that she was really into Jan because she was craving stability. And she felt like at that point in her life, she was ready for stability. And because he was older and had kids, that's what she thought that he could provide. I mean, who needs a lawyer when you have an older man, right? Stability. So that her childhood probably influenced her need and craving for that stability. Um, because as we know, things with March Sr. Were, were always very unpredictable. You never knew what was going to happen with March. But she fell in love with Jan's three kids and she settled very quickly into the role of stepmom. They weren't officially married yet, but like, you know, she was willing to take care of the kids and, and fill that role and go to, she said she was, she was trading in you know, nightclubs for PTA meetings. I'm like, okay, daddy, Zach, why am I, am I daddy? I'm not daddy. Call me daddy. Um, 
she says that she quickly moved in with Jan and, but she was still working, but also running the household. So that was very challenging for her balancing all of that. But she's like, I wanted it. I was ready for it. I was here for it. But apparently Marge Sr. was not a fan of Jan. Marge Sr. and Jan did not get along. They would always fight. They would always argue. They couldn't see eye to eye. Um, her mother wanted Margaret to have like a fairy tale and Jan was not her idea of what a fairy tale should have been, especially for Margaret. You don't think, oh yeah, let me just have my daughter marry some old man with three kids who left his his wife. And you don't think that that's necessarily your fairy tale. Just as Lala. She thought that was her fairy tale too, though. At least Randall had a lot of money. Jan had money. Jan was very well off, but there were a lot of red flags with Jan. And she'd like kept ignoring the red flags, probably very serious. Margaret says she doesn't have daddy issues, my fairy hill. So that she did not have daddy issues, even though her dad wasn't a part of her life. She insists that was not the reason she went after Jan. She went after Jan because he was stable and he could provide a life that her current boyfriend couldn't. So he ended up giving her what she wanted, though, and she wanted a ring she was ready to be a wife. She wanted a kid because that's something that she always wanted to do was have a child of her own. And then he bought her a car on top of that. It wasn't a great car, but it was a functional car and it worked. They had a great wedding. They kicked off their marriage on a great foot and it was equipped with a very exotic wedding and they would have sex every day and relax a lot. And Jan describes their honeymoon as just a little too relaxing, which who would describe their wedding, their honeymoon as too relaxing because that's what you go for extra relaxing. And Margaret's like, I had a great time. And Jan was like, meh. And that's like Jan's vibe. Jan is very meh. He always finds something wrong with something. And like, who the fuck wants a Jan in their life, right? Give me back Harrison. I will take Harrison over Jan every day. Thank you very much. Sounds like my life. Oh no, LV Nights. Girl, that doesn't sound like a great, happy marriage. Um, but like I said, at the end of every chapter, she ends them with her life lessons. This chapter, we end with life lessons. Lesson number one, you can have you can love someone so much that you can hate them. It's a very fine line. At the end of the day, marriage is a contract and a contract means business. Snap, snap. And then her final lesson of the evening of this chapter is don't mistake naivete for blindness. Protect yourself. No one else is going to. Snap, snap. There you go. Those are Margaret's lessons about marriage or about finding marriage. Love and marriage, love and marriage. Then we get into chapter six. And chapter six is called Just Add Water. So after their honeymoon, she was settling into their marriage very perfectly. But Jan was completely neurotic about money. And she wasn't a big fan of that because she loved to spend money. But he was always like, I don't think we have enough money. We need focus on money and we need to get money. We need to not be spending money. And Margaret was a big spender. Margaret loved to spend money. But both Jan and Margaret were working full time and they lived very comfortably. They had full time help. Like there was no real need to worry about money, but Jan clearly had a lot of money noise. He should probably read A Place of Yes by Bethany Frankel, but I don't think he's ever going to. She was much younger than Jan. So, you know, she definitely garnered herself some looks from the other wives in the, in the car pick up the card pull drop off line, which says that eventually people stopped batting an eyelash once they actually got to know her and realized, oh, okay, this isn't just some young bimbo that Jan's parading around town. She's actually, you know, she's got a good head on her shoulders and a great pair, according to Margaret. Margaret says that she brought, she brought their family or their household dynamic a sense of peace and calm to the family. She said that their, the kid's mom, Jan's ex, was not very motherly. She basically abandoned them. She accuses her of having a prescription drug problem and says that she only came around for Mother's Day, probably to get the gifts. She sounds like a real prize. I wonder why Jan ever left her. So uh, she really dogs out the ex-wife in the book, which, I mean, come on, it's a little rough. But she really does dog her out and says that she basically filled that parental role instead of the ex-wife, which she calls Eveline. I think her name was Evelyn. And so she changed it to Evelyn, Evelyn. Even Margaret Sr. embraced uh, Jan's kids and treated them like her grandkids. She accepted them as her own. Um, and she went above and beyond to 
be there for them, which even Margaret was kind of like, whoa, you couldn't even be there for me as a kid, but you're going to be over here for somebody else's kids. I love you for it. But I also, I'm a little, got to have a head tilt. Hi, Sophia. What's going on, Sophia? Uh, Welcome on in, guys. Welcome on in. But Margaret said that she was really good at bringing the families together. So Marge Sr. and Jan's parents and always hosting the dinners and hosting the holidays. And she brought everyone together. And she said they all got along very fabulously. She loved her in-laws. And they just had great relationships, which, I mean, great. Life sounds great, right? Well, up next, Margaret wanted a child. She's like, I'm ready for my own baby. I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. And John was like, oh, I don't know if I want a baby. She's like, you have to give me a baby. You said that you were going to give me a baby. So he's like, fine, okay, I'll give you a baby. So then she gets off the pill and immediately she gets pregnant, which Jan was not all that excited about. And that's just one of the many, many red flags that Margaret saw in him. I actually don't know what she saw in him other than red flags, to be honest with you. And then she has her life lessons for this chapter, chapter six. And these life lessons are motherhood is not defined by the act of birth. Sometimes you don't know what you are missing all along until you find it. So if anyone feels lost in life, just go looking for a baby. Then we get into chapter seven. Dun, 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 dun. Chapter seven. Bring is, is titled Icing on the Cake. And this is where Margaret talks about how she was a very neurotic pregnant woman, very neurotic mother to be. Jan was neurotic about finances. She was neurotic about her pregnancy. Says that she even set up weekly sonograms with her doctor and she would eat for comfort constantly. So she was just a hot mess express. She was always, you know, eating and freaking out and thinking something was wrong. And Jan was terrible at like helping nav like navigate those fears. And he was like, not willing to budge on that. But Jan was literally freaking out about having a baby, especially when they found out the baby was going to be a boy because then Jan was like, holy guacamole. Now this is all going to be my responsibility. Like if it, at least if it were a girl, Margaret would have to take care of her and that'd be all her responsibility. But now that it was a boy, he was like, oh no, what did I get myself into? Which is always a great sign when you decide to have a baby with somebody. You always want them to feel like, oh no, what am I getting myself into? But Margaret was excited. Jan was distant and he just assumed since he was having a son, he was going to have to really carry the burden, the burden of having a baby. But she said that pregnancy, she got through it. The delivery was super easy. She popped them right out within 15 minutes, like a little, you know, chicken pot pie that you put in the oven. It was just right out, baby. She was happy. She was excited because this was her first. She raised the other three, but now she had a baby that was her own. And Apparently, Jan didn't really want her to be a full-time mom, so he made sure that they had full-time staff to help care for the baby, but she really wanted to take the lead because, one, she had already raised three kids, and two, like, this was her baby, so she didn't really want to share the baby with the staff, but she had a full staff. So whenever she wanted them, they were there. She says that uh, the family was obsessed with little baby Cooper. Her mom loved little baby Cooper. His parents loved little baby Cooper, but... but Jan was not obsessed with Margaret's post baby body. He like wouldn't really want to be seen with her. He would do all the fun stuff with the baby, but he was very distant from Margaret. He didn't even have a really active role in taking care of the baby because in his head, he's like, we have a full-time staff. We have a nanny. We have a night nurse. Like, why do I need to be taking care of this kid? I'm already a grown man. I can't even get it up anymore without a, a blue pill. Why do I need to be worrying about the baby? Why do I need to be getting it up in the middle of the night if I can't even get it up in the middle of the night? Thank you very much. So- Margaret said that he didn't like fat people, that really that's, that was what she felt about him. I don't know how true that is, but he would also make comments about Marge Sr.'s weight because she was also a stress eater. So he was always like, oh, that's not good. She's fat. She needs to lose weight. And Margaret was like, oh, that's not very nice. But I mean, it is true. She's not very healthy. He wasn't empathetic to her even being a new mom either. So in addition to like criticizing her body, he was like... <laughs> you need to get back to work. Like we need to pay these bills. And she's like, we're fine. We don't need to pay these bills. We have good jobs. Like we're good. Let me have some maternity leave. And he's like, nope, you popped out your baby. It's been a few weeks. It's time for you to get back to work because you said that you were going to do it. And that was our, that was the deal that we made. And Margaret was like, geez, well, why does everything have to be so transactional? So while back at work, Margaret said that she got very sick. She had thyroid issues and she would get dizzy and she was losing all this weight, which I'm sure Jan was very happy about. Ultimately, it ended up having her stay home um, 
because she wasn't feeling well and she had to constantly be taking medication. So she had to take a little time off, which she was excited about because then she got to be with the baby a lot more. And then eventually the company that she was at, they had to do some budget cuts, the company, and they were willing, they weren't willing to, they wanted to cut her pay. And she was like, oh, hell no. Thank you, next. I ain't going to sit here and do the same work for less pay. Thank you, next. So she stopped working and she decided to spend more time with the kids. And Jan was very unsupportive and very dismissive of Margaret and very unhappy with the fact that she was no longer going to be working. Their fights even started to get bad. And she would call their in-laws to get involved and help mediate, which I don't even know if that's a healthy thing. Like, are you really going to be calling your in-laws and be like, hey, can you help me diffuse the situation with Jan? Because we're having an argument about him leaving the socks out next to the bed and not putting them in the hamper. You know? Hi, tater tots. What's going on? What's going on? Hey, hottie. Hi. But one thing that they did do right together was parenting so that they had a really good parenting relationship. They worked really well together, even with Jan's witch of an ex-wife who Margaret didn't like. And the ex-wife was Evelyn. She hated Margaret, but she still sent her a very generous Tiffany's gift for the baby. But eventually it was time for Margaret to go back to work. She was like, okay, it took some time. I watched the baby. You know, I kind of got it out of my system. And now I feel like I'm itching for something. And she wanted to go back to work. So she started doing some freelance styling and makeup on commercials. But she was like, I think that there's more for me. And that brings us to the end of that chapter. And the life lessons here are motherhood changes your priorities and gives you a new perspective. So if you need a new perspective, just go and get a baby. Her next life lesson is be confident in your judgment and trust that you know what's best for you and your child. Yes, that's right, Margaret. You know what's best for you and your baby girl. Then we get into chapter eight. And chapter eight is the final chapter of book club this week. And it's called Birth on the Kitchen Table. And this one's really about Margaret building her business. And so she wanted to raise... Cooper as Jewish. So she sent him to a Jewish school and decided that, that was the perfect time for her to start her own business because now he was a little more, you know, focused on something else. Hi, Rebecca from Hi, Rebecca from Dallas. Don't I don't it doesn't matter if you're late, girl. You can always watch the rebroadcast. And I love that you even joined us tonight. Rebecca from Dallas. <clears throat> So what she ended up doing is calling up her friend Beth and her friend Beth was like an artist and was very creative. So she's like, yo, Beth, why don't we go to Home Depot and we're going to buy some tin buckets and we're going to decorate them. We're going to embellish them and make them look really cute. And then we're going to take them to kids accessory stores and, you know, we're going to get them to buy them from us. And she said there was nothing else like that on the market. And that together they created Macbeth Collection, which is a combination of Margaret's name and Beth, the artist friend that she decided to collaborate with. So she said that she took them, they took them to the stores and they sold out in one day. And then the demand just kept building from there. They were really excited about, about it because they're like, whoa, look at us. You know, Danielle's over there down the street getting engaged 19 times as a prostitution whore. And we're not going to be prostitution whores. We're going to be business women. And eventually it grew from a little side gig that they would do just to kind of keep busy as a hobby. And it turned into a full-time career. But Jan wasn't thrilled about that. But his sister, I guess, was supportive because she ended up giving them a loan, an $8,000 loan to help get the business going. So obviously Margaret was using her own money, but the money, her own finances were starting to deplete after she quit her job and then had some unemployment money. And so she didn't have a ton of money to be invested in this project. And Jan was like, this is really just a hobby. It's not an actual business. But Jan's sister decided, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you eight grand. And Margaret was like, all right, cool, let's go. And with that eight grand, they entered into a major trade show out in Manhattan. And that's where they made some real sales and they were able to take their business to the next level. They made $60,000 in profit at that event or sorry, $60,000 in sales at the event, which was huge. I mean, 60 grand at one event, at one trade show. I mean, obviously it was a big trade show, but when your investment was 8,000 and then you make six grand, like that's actually pretty cool, pat the puss. But um, they realized very quickly that they had to stop shopping for their supplies at full price at Home Depot and they needed to start buying in bulk and opening up their own factory to meet all of the demand of the product that they were selling. 
I'm with fam and they're loud talking on the TV. And I'm just like, YOLO, Zach, book club. That's right, Alicia, YOLO, book club. We got caviar dreams on a tuna fish budget. Now I want some tuna fish. Yum. Um, anyway. Said that Jan eventually was like, okay, I guess this little side hobby is a real deal and I'm going to invest in this. And he finally invested $35,000 and came on board to help support the the Macbeth collection. And, you know, passion, her passion was fueled or her fuel was passion. And she says that when your fuel is passion, the money comes next. But Jan was just solely focused on the profit. And he started to see that his business was declining while her business was really starting to bloom. But he decided that it was time to get rid of Beth. He's like, that bitch got to go. Time to cut that bitch. And he's like, we need to buy her out because we can't do this company anymore with her because she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. And Jan and Margaret were basically carrying the business well beyond Beth's skill set. And they were like, all right, Beth, we got to cut you out. And it ultimately that conversation ended the friendship between Margaret and her friend, Beth, because Beth was like, you guys think you're going to be more successful than me? Well, fine. I'll wave at you when you're on Oprah, bitch. And then Margaret was like, well, Oprah's not on TV anymore, but I am. Margaret's like, "Mm -mm, don't mix money and friendship because it gets way too complicated. But the business continued to bloom even without Beth, actually, especially without Beth, because they were like, Beth was just a hot mess express and she didn't really bring that much to the table. And Margaret's like, I went to fashion school. Like I know how to have, how to make things creative. And I know how to, um, you know, market things. And I know how to see consumer demand and uh, who needs Beth anyway. Inventory continued to sell. They were getting lots of press. They were making all these like hot press gift gift lists for like Mother's Day or for Christmas. Like they were always on the gift list. And they started introducing new products. And she quickly learned the importance of hiring people who are good at things that you're not very good at. Margaret's like, I'm very good at being a creative director, but I'm terrible at money. I'm terrible at planning. I'm terrible at time management. So she's like, that balance is imperative to success. So you need somebody that can kind of help balance you out. And Beth was clearly not the person to help balance her out. So, you know, Beth had to get the boot and we had to bring in some new people. But she's like, you know what? You just got to come up with a creative idea a unique idea, a unique creative idea, or if it's the idea is already out there and somebody else has gotten it, figure out how you can improve upon that, improve upon what's already out on the market and make it better or make it more accessible to a new audience and definitely find a mentor and definitely lift people up because business ain't easy and you need to make sure you're killing it like Bethany, okay? And her final life lessons of the night are, it's more, impor- it's more important to know what you're not good at than what you are good at. Your strengths will always be there to play too, but your weaknesses could be your downfall. Dun, dun, dun. Know your strengths, but know your weaknesses more. Surround yourself with people who should inspire or surrounding yourself with successful people should inspire you and not make you feel inferior. Acknowledge that you've earned your seat at the table and then listen and learn take notes. Oh, thank you, Diane. I enjoy listening to you. You're good at telling the goss. Well, thanks, Diane. I appreciate that. Tonight, I'm not telling so much goss as much as I'm giving you Margaret's life lessons. Uh, And then Margaret concludes with her final life lesson. Being in the business with friends can be great if both friends mean business. Put everything in writing. Everything. Even your naughty text messages. Write it, with, that's not what Dorinda said. Dorinda's life lesson was write it, regret it, say it, forget it. Go Dorinda, Dorita. Thank you, my boy, Ollie. Thank you, my Barry Hill. And thank you, LV Knights Corps, for the additional two badges. You guys are coming in with the badges. I love it, I love it, I love it. Yes. <sighs> What's going on, guys? How's your night going? Did you enjoy these chapters of Margaret Joseph's book, Caviar Dreams, Tuna Fish Budget. Tonight we broke down chapters five, six, five, six, seven, and eight. Thanks, Diane. Love you too, boo. And the next week we're breaking down nine, 10, 11, and 12. Family affair, boobs and buckets, fixing the pipes and renovating the dream. Sounds like we're going to be leaving Jan soon. 
Thank you, Shelly girl, for the three badges. Look at you guys coming on in with the badges. Some really good things to know as you navigate life. Absolutely. I think there's lots of really great advice in here for life. Lots of really great advice in here for business. I've been in a very business mindset, so you make the books more entertaining. Well, thank you, Suki. I appreciate that. Sorry, just jumped in. Did you already have a side between Margaret and Teresa going off of the upcoming season's reported feud? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, part of me is kind of leaning towards Margaret. Hey, Margaret. Um, I mean, it's hard because you have Margaret who's really kind of stirring the pot and, and getting into the nitty gritty and... <sighs> I don't know. I feel like I'm team Margaret only because I don't know how I want to root for Teresa and I want her, her relationship with Louie to really blossom and be what she needs and deserves. However, I don't know if I fully trust Louie yet. And it seems like Margaret is coming from a good place of being like, Hey, you should look out for this guy. So I think I'm definitely team Margaret right now because I believe Margaret's intentions were good and they weren't just to stir the pot and Teresa just didn't receive them very well. And I think, you know, Margaret definitely meant well. You know? Hi, Texas Phoenix. Throw them hips, girl. Boom, 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 boom. Giddy, giddy. Giddy and and throw them hips, girl. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, Suki, Suki, Suki Denton, 2019, and L and Shelly girl with the badges, three badges each. You guys are making my night. Tonight is the night. How much of the Louis Goss do you believe? Um. Also a really good question. I think I believe 20% of the rumors only because I feel like 20% of rumors is all that's really true ever. Um, I think people always exaggerate rumors. They blow things out of proportion. I've heard rumors about him. Apparently there's a video about him and that's what Margaret brings up on the show. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on Louie? He gives me heebie-jeebies. I don't know. We don't know much about Louis other than the photos we've seen of them together. This will be the first time we really ever see Louis. So I don't have much, I don't have much of a judgment. Um, like I said, the only rumors that I've ever heard of him are that he is really like sex obsessed and he used to host like Tantra classes. He was apparently a big philander. I believe that there were some domestic violence accusations in his past. So, oh, what was the video, Audrey? Can you give us um, the tea on what the video was? I have not seen the video. Do you think Louie targeted Teresa? <sighs> Another really good question. Um, maybe. I think that's what the concerns are. I think that's what Margaret's concerns are. That'll be brought up. Oh, it was a cult video. Oh, was it the Tantra video? I think it, it was about him like hosting these Tantra classes. So if it's related to that, I wouldn't be surprised. Or was it like a Mary's Church cult video, you know, where she's like rolling on the floor and sending Jesus after people? He was like with a handful of guys on the beach. Interesting. It was a, okay, it was a handful of guys on the beach. It looked like a cult. A cult or an orgy? Because an orgy doesn't sound so bad. He must be giving it to her good. Tantra. Yeah, he's giving it to her good. That's why she likes it so much. No, it was a bunch of dudes on a beach, some warrior club. Oh, well, then that, I mean, is that really that incriminating, though? Mary with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I feel like we have to wait and see what happens. Or maybe, but I thought that it was like begged his ex that was sorry for the emotional abuse yeah i know no none of those men weren't into orgies they look like cavemen i mean why can't cavemen be into orgies i mean that seems like a hot one to have the cavemen and orgies heck yeah mary is gone is she though because she was on spaces on twitter spaces last night and she had some tea to spill i think he may be an opportunist um all right well let's wrap up bravo book club I'll do after party over at Just Plain Zach and we can chat more about all the other questions that people have. And then we have our regular Thursday night live with the with the tea. So 
Thank you guys for joining Bravo Book Club tonight. I'll be doing after party over at Just Plain Zach so we can answer all the questions and chat about Mary and all that stuff over there. But thank you guys. If you haven't gotten a copy yet, be sure to get your copy of Caviar Dreams Tuna Fish Budget. All the books, we have what, Lala Ken's book. We have, um, what was the other book? Uh, Not All Diamonds and Rosé. All the books are available. Yeah, we'll talk about Adam's interview. Um, all the books are available in my Amazon storefront, which is amazon.com slash shop slash Zach Peter. There's a whole list of, with all the Bravo books if anybody wants to order them. I also like doing Audible. If you don't have Audible, I believe I have an Audible link too. Audible.com slash Zach, Z-A-C-K, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. This was fun. These four chapters were fun. We'll be doing another four chapters next Tuesday. Every Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Pacific, 9.30 Eastern. We'll have our regular Thursday night live this Thursday. It'll be a good time. All right, guys. Love you, love you, love you. Mean it. I'm popping over for after party.